Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is uh, Georgios Diamantopoulos, if you like a ton tongue twister. Um, the founder of uh, Zero to MVP. We're a development agency. We work with uh, non-technical founders to build their product. But today I'm, I'm here to talk to you about a slightly different uh, subject, which is our, our health and the kind of impact of the, the work that we do. And, you know, if we, if we think a little bit about why we are all here and, and what is connecting us, you know, it's, it's our love for computers, for technology, for machines, let's say, and, you know, what it enables us to, to do. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I uh, started using a computer when I was about 10 years old. And, you know, from that day onwards, I've spent many, many hours um, in front of it. I'm sure you're, uh, you're similar in that way. And, you know, the thing is we, we come to these conferences because, you know, we build systems with computers and we, we really take care of those systems. We want them to work and be functional and not have bugs and, you know, 100% uptime. Um, and, but I think we can, we can do a much better job at actually taking care of our, of our bodies as an industry um, also. Now, um, who's actually read the book, The Picture of Dorian Gray? Anybody? All right. Four or five people? That's great. Does uh, the rest of the people, do you, have you heard of the book? Yes? Okay, so a couple of nods. Anyway, the, the story of, um, of this book by Oscar Wilde He's a really great author, and it's a really great book, so please read it if you can. Um, it's basically about this young man, uh, Dorian, who doesn't want to grow old, and he wants to stay you know, young and, and beautiful. He's, he's supposed to be quite attractive uh, guy, and he makes this uh, bargain where he, he has this portrait, and he, he says, this, this portrait will age instead of me, and I can go out and live my life you know, without any worries. I can just have fun. Um, but every time he goes back and sees the portrait, the portrait has become more and more kind of uh, grotesque, and he, he kind of gets sick of it. He hates it. And near the end, not the end, so I don't want to completely spoil the book, uh, but he stabs it. You know, he, he can't take it anymore. So the book really, I mean, it's many things, but to me it's about youth and about, you know, living without worrying of the consequences. But I think we should start worrying about the consequences of the work that we do. And, um, you know, when you speak to, to other people and you say, well, oh, I have these aches and you know, my back hurts or whatever, they go, well, you know, it's, you're not really carrying any, you know, heavy objects. You just sit in a chair all day. So, you know, and we have this kind of perception, I think, between us also, right, that we, we don't think we do anything excruciating with our bodies. So the, the main actor of the talk is uh, the chair. Um, and... I was trying to figure out a way to kind of explain um, the the kind of situation that we put uh, ourselves in when we sit all day. Um, and the best I could find is this. Uh, here you have uh, Atlas, who's you know who's carrying the world, right? And you see how his uh, like the weight is like really squishing him down, right? Um, and here you have a, a power lifter, an Olympic power lifter. And if you notice, now this is a very subtle difference, but if you notice, the weight is, she's not resisting the weight, she's pushing the weight, right? So it's two different relations inside of their bodies. So um, the, the reason why I wanted to give this talk is because I think that, you know, obviously with all the technological advancements that we've had and our, you know, our, our um, everything about our lives that has improved over the, the last kind of 50 years, for all of that, we're actually aging faster. I think the you know, the people who work in front of computers. So the, the question I want to leave you with is, you know, how do you imagine yourself when you're 80 years old? 
Are you someone who you know needs support to get around, whether that's a person or a cane or technology, maybe by that time? Or are you someone who can you know enjoy some casual exercise with their partner, or even actually like really exercise, right, and do squats like the the young man on the right? And the the question after that is, what do I need to be doing now? so that I can have that then when I'm 80. And for me, that's you know about 40 years in the future, um, which can be a lot of time, but you know we all know that time is kind of relative, like sometimes it goes really fast. I will have to say that you know I'm not a doctor, I'm a developer like you. This is not medical advice, this is just kind of my research and my personal experience. So please always uh, do your own research and use your, your best judgment. And um, obviously this talk is not about me, but th these are just some of the things that I've done over the years. You know, I, uh, when I was a kid, I was a little bit clumsy. I tried a few team sports. Um, the, it didn't go too well. And then uh, later on, I found out, uh, you know, weights. I went to the gym when I was about, I don't know, 16, something like that. And that was technical. You know, like I met a, a bodybuilder and he, you know, he kind of taught me all the things, how to do, design a program. And I was like, you know, oh, this is good. I can do this. Um, and of course, it was solo. I, you know, I didn't have to cooperate with anybody else to, to do it. Uh, then later on, uh, when the, the Olympics, uh, the China Olympics, I think it was 2004, I believe, uh, I saw someone um, perform gymnastics for the first time. I hadn't seen it at, up to that point. He was doing the Iron Cross. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I really want to do that. So I found a gymnastics class and I was trained. I was really trying to um, get to the cross. This is <laughs> one of the photos where I was really disappointed that I, you know, it wasn't as easy as it seemed on the, um, on the video. And then um, over, over the years, I did some crazy workouts, uh, like the top right, where I was jumping up and down for, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes. Um, and I thought, at the time, I thought that was a good idea. Um, and eventually, I found this, which is, uh, I don't know if you guys seen this instrument. It's a club. You don't hit anybody with it. That's always what everybody thinks uh, when they see this. Um, you use it as a weight, like you use weights at the gym, but uh, the kind of mechanics are different because the center of mass is so far out uh, outside of your body. Um, that kind of put me in, um, uh, in a path where I found out a lot about my body. It, you know, I, like to get here, which is this is from the the test I had to take to actually get certified and kind of get a you know piece of paper that says that oh you've learned some technique. Um, but I had to go through all that stuff over there, which um, I didn't start to, uh, to go there. Like, I, that, that wasn't where I was trying to go. Um, but I, I, try, I started learning a lot about uh, our joints and our range of motion and, and how, we, uh, how we move and um, uh, being able to move better, basically. And then um, that, that whole path eventually led me to, to attend a, an actual dissection. So I was in a lab with other people. Um, so like today where I'm you know, the only person presenting a, you know, a non-technical uh, talk at a technical conference, at this dissection I was the only developer <laughs> in a group of like, um, there were some doctors in there, some Pilates instructors, um, all kinds of people, manual therapists. And we used a, a scalpel to actually dissect the body and see what's inside it. And we're trying to observe specific things that I'll, um, I'll go through in a second. Um, and I, I told you all this stuff about myself and the kind of, uh, uh, types of exercise that I've, I've tried in the past because I think there comes a point where everybody has this uh, fall from grace moment where we think something about something and then we discover that it's not quite that way. For me, that came uh, during the COVID era. And I think the, the COVID uh, situation, you know, uh, brought out the 
like it shine a light on on our weaknesses collectively i mean even as societies as countries also, but also as individuals and uh during covid i stopped from you know going from working out every day um doing all that all that stuff i stopped doing it, all of it and i increased my workload so i started working i don't know 14 15 16 days which i'm sure you've all done at uh, one point of your life or another and of course i was always at home uh, i was more stressed um and, and so on so one day i had this um this really great idea to do a workout and i tried to do it at the pace that i had done it you know months ago yeah um so anyway something happened to my knee and it, like it didn't i didn't um i didn't call an ambulance or anything it just became really inflammated um but then i and in that uh, i don't know two years whatever with the quarantine and all that i also had a lot of back pain so um the the point of all that is that i i had an mri on my knee and on my spine and um the mri showed that um i have a a, a disc uh, about here um which is starting to dehydrate and we'll we'll i'll show you some images of what that means in a little bit and that my knees have you know a, a good amount of wear and tear nothing huge though right so i didn't rip anything Again, I didn't have to have surgery. It wasn't anything drastic, but to me that was a big deal, right? I thought I was this, you know, strong, fit person, and then I realized that my body is, you know, I'm, I was less than 40 at the time, and it's starting to kind of degrade faster than I thought it should, let's say. I think you've all seen this, right, or a variation of it. I don't know who made it. I would really love to find out at some point. So if you have a reference, please... Uh, you know, uh, give me a shout. Um, I think I, I like this uh, addition that I've seen recently. Um, and, you know, this shows kind of our supposed ascension through evolution, where we go from the apes who are kind of, you know, hunched like this, and then we stand up, you know, all proud with our tools. And then the computer comes along and we're <laughs> like this again. And then, you know, tablets even worse, we're not even sitting on a desk. Um, of course, it's not exactly the computer, you know, we all started doing this when we were, what, four or five? Um, you know, we went to school and they put us in a chair and they said, well, sit still and learn all of this and don't fidget because that means you're not paying attention, right? Stay still. And going to the, the modern environment, um, I'm sure you've seen yourself or others uh, be like this. And I'll um, draw your attention to, to me right now because I don't, I don't like pointing uh, to things on the screen too much. But you'll see that um, up there uh, also that when people are in front of a screen, the, the, their head kind of moves forward a little bit over time. I mean, you know, we all, in the beginning, we all sit straight like this. We're proud, right? But then after a few minutes, something happens in the screen maybe we can't see it very well or generally speaking our head is designed to go towards the thing that we're paying attention to so that's kind of natural um and then you know we're, we're reaching for the the keyboard and the mouse so our shoulders have the tendency to go forward when the shoulders go forward our chest closes that means we um the 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 volume that we have to breathe in our chest is actually collapsed, it becomes smaller, so our uh, breathing is restricted. All of this stuff that we have here, and we have a lot of good stuff uh, under, the, under the abs and under, you know, not the superficial, like uh, deeper in. That's another uh, lecture probably, but um, uh, all of that becomes very relaxed. Um, our back becomes hyperextended. Uh, all of this tightens up, you know, our wrist is, um, and our forearms are uh, completely uh, twisted all day because we, we have to grab the mouse. And then our hips are pointing outwards, um, or in the case of these ladies, uh, which is another pattern usually uh, done by women, but 
with you know by some men as well so they're like this so it's a different relation but it's another thing that they do all day every day and our knees and our uh, ankles are kind of locked up right so they these are really mobile places in our bodies but we restrict them into not moving um, all day I could probably um, say more about that but that's enough Uh, by the way, this is really interesting that uh, these two photos, I got all of these photos from uh, Unsplash, and these two photos are from profiles that are selling uh, standing desks. Now, you'll notice that this guy is, obviously, he's there for a photo shoot. It's not, he wasn't just working there and someone took a photo of him, right? Um, but you see, he's, you know, he's really trying to be straight, but then his head, naturally, I mean, he has to look at the screen, he's, you know, forward. And the same with this lady who's also standing. Okay, so that's all the stuff that I said. Um, the, the real issue with all of that is that anything that we do repeatedly, our body tries to adapt to it, right? Our neurology says, um, okay, you, you've been doing that all the time, that means I have to make it more efficient. So it, it actually lays more structure to make that um, easier to do inside your body. Even if that outcome is actually negative for you in the long term or, or not useful, right? So our neurology alone doesn't have the kind of, let's say, capability to judge that this is not necessary or you know, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, it, it, that's part of our kind of conscious, it, it, it can only be part of our conscious um, uh, thoughts. Um, you guys all seen these, right? Okay, these are great. These are amazing. Um, and I, I actually had, um, I hired someone to come to my house and help me set up my equipment like this. It's really hard because um, the, you know, whoever drew this made the person match the furniture. Furniture doesn't match us, right? So my, you know, the, the, the lengths of my, uh, you know, the parts of my body don't always line up with how the furniture needs to be. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that this is great when you start, right? When you sit down, you can do this. But over time, especially after half an hour, an hour, this is impossible to maintain. Um, so it's unrealistic, in my opinion. Um, so, um, and, and with the consultant, it was, it was pretty funny because I kept saying, well, this is not perfect. This is, you know, doesn't match that. So, you know, you have to work harder to help me, you know, adjust it. And eventually she just said, look, man, you know, you need to move around. You can't be sitting all day. I was like, what? That's not what I brought you here for. Um, so again, this is what I've been saying that, you know, the ergonomics, they're static, right? They, they are a photo, a snapshot in time. And over time is, is not particularly, um, pragmatic to think that we can do that unless you're a monk you know those guys can do that they can sit for hours like this but that's part of like they're doing that you know on purpose and it's another completely dif different thing so holding any posture will produce an adaptation whether that adaptation is valuable to, uh, to you in the long term or not and the body just needs you uh, your, your body needs to be able to move. All right, so uh, just so you guys understand what these kinds of adaptations that I'm talking about are, this is a, um, uh, some photos for a, a software that helps um, practitioners, uh, manual practitioners, like draw all these lines and actually understand where the imbalances are. Now, we, you know, we may be looking at this person who's obviously half naked, but the, I have two things to po point out, that if she was fully dressed, you wouldn't be able to see all this. It takes a very trained eye 
And it's only after you've actually put those lines on her body that you can judge her for being imbalanced, right? Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that when we see someone like that, even if we detect these, um, these situations in, in, uh, in their body, we usually think that that's always been there. That's really not the case. This is a testament to the life that she's been living, right? There have been situations in her life that caused reactions in her body um, that made, it, made this kind of permanent. So she's not a special case, is what I'm trying to say. This is happening to all of us in small, smaller degrees until something happens and it becomes larger, right? And then it's really easy to notice. So with the chair, I, you know, the, the, the part of our body that takes the most pain is our spine, really. It comes back to what I was saying about, you know, um, the atlas holding the world, like the, all our weight is compressing our spine. So even if you have you know, what we think is the, the perfect position on the chair, you're still getting 40% more pressure on your discs than you're getting if you're just standing. This is not an argument for standing desks, even though they are slightly better. Um, you know, you still have the issue of the head going forward and that, that breaks, that actually increases the disc pressure. So it's not, it's good if you can have variety and you can sit down and stand up and do your work in, in various positions, but it's not something that just, you know, the, the magic bullet, it's not that. And of course, we can't actually work in this position because again, our head will be <laughs> way over there, even if our spine is there. Um, so if any of you had, have had uh, neck pain or um, lower back pain, usually this is why it happens. Our sit bones, this is the, our hips, our, this is called our sit bone. And it's supposed to be absolutely perpendicular to what we're sitting on so that the spine can stay straight and the head can be on top of the spine, right? The, our head is really heavy, by the way. I don't know if you guys know this, but I can't remember if it's the heaviest part of our bodies, but uh, in terms of uh, actual weight, it's really, really heavy. Um, but if you start breaking either, um, this position, like I said, is easily broken. Like it's not, um, you're not being a bad person if you can't hold this for, you know, more than 15 minutes, right? This is what I thought of myself. I was like, why can't I do this? I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be fit. Um, so it doesn't matter if it starts because your head started going forward or maybe your hips um, or your knees got a little bit uh, tired, so you shifted your hips. Like any shift will kind of lead you to this position. And uh, that puts a lot of pressures on, on these uh, discs and a lot of pressure on the, on the muscles here on the back, which have to work in a hyperextended position and they really uh, lock up. Again, I'm here because I'm, I'm really concerned about this. Um, as I was when I found out about my own spine, you know, in the MRI, um, I looked into the literature and I found research that says that hernias, which is um, all these degenerations, I'll go through them in a minute, but the, the spine degenerations are actually starting to appear in teenagers. Why? Because they play games and they don't go out and play football or basketball or whatever, you know, is popular in the neighborhood, or was popular in the neighborhood. <clears throat> um, and of course, you know, if you have a slightly overweight person, um, and again, this is not about aesthetics, but it's, you know, the, obviously there's even more pressure on the discs. Um, these are, this is how the, uh, you know, doctors name all the, um, the vertebrae, so the little bones on the spine. Most of the problems um, in our profession are down here, so where the, uh, the greens um, uh, vertebrae is and the, the blue, the beginning of the blue, and, and also on the coccyx, which, which is the, the last bone 
the tailbone, if you uh, have, have heard of that, which um, depending on your, the position you put your hip on the chair can be touching the chair and that cre can create a lot of problems also. Um, but this is the sort of uh, different kinds of de degenerations of the spine, right? So at the, at the top, you have a healthy disc. The disc, um, so these are the vertebrae, right? Oops. These are the vertebrae, the, the bones, and then the disc is what we call the disc, the gel between the bones, right? So it's a gel structure that um, can absorb, obviously, uh, stress and, and so on. Uh, degenerated disc means that it started to become dehydrated. We say that, um, we say it like, doctors say it like that, but it doesn't have to do with how much water you, you drink. Uh, it means that um, there's no nutrients being delivered to that disc because you're not moving it, right? And I'll get to that in a second again. Um, the bulging disc is, you see here on the sides, it started, the gel started from the pressure going outwards. And we say that it's herniated when it's, um, when it's gone outside of the canal. So the fluid can actually um, spread out into the outside of the spine. And that, that can be uh, very painful and uh, cause a, a lot of other problems. A thinning disc is where the, the gel has uh, compacted. And then uh, a really kind of, <laughs> I should say severe, I guess I will say severe. Uh, degeneration is when the, the body is trying to then protect the, uh, the disc and is growing little bones down here, the, what's called osteophytes. So it's growing little bones to, to make up for the, uh, for the loss of the disc. Uh, this is, these are actual pictures of discs. Um, the top one is the healthy one. So you see, that's why we, we say it's kind of hydrated. It's like uh, more, more juicy, I guess. <laughs> uh, and it, it does become dried up. The way it becomes dried up is because it's not receiving nutrients. Um, why does it not receive nutrients? No, it's further down. But I'll, I'll come back to the why, not the, the nutrients part. Um, and this is what happens when a disc becomes dehydrated or herniated and is causing problems, uh, meaning pain, intense pain. Um, this is what uh, orthopedics will do. They, you go into surgery and they put these, um, these screws um, ar around. I I'm not sure if it's on the same vertebrae or the, it's on the one above and the one below, I think. Uh, this is the dehydrated disc. It shows up more like bone than the other ones, which you see they're, they're almost invisible. And the, the issue with this, uh, of course it works, right? That, that creates space between the vertebrae so the, the bones can't touch. I mean, in, in extreme cases when the disc is completely gone, the, the bones can touch and that apparently, I've never experienced it, but apparently it can be very, very, very painful. So they, they put the metal there and that creates space, but the, the problem with that operation is that then the, uh, the vertebrae on either side become uh, immobile, so they start degenerating even faster. So you, after a few years, you have to get another operation on the other below or above. So the, um, uh, does anybody kind of get aches and pains on their joints at the end of, the, of a long day at work? Yeah, a couple of hands, a few, few more, okay. That happens because, and, and this is going back to the nutrients, um, we have our heart, which is essentially a pump, right? It pumps blood in all the places that have arteries and uh, veins, and that takes away toxic stuff and puts nutrients where they're needed. Our joint system has uh, some fluids but there's no pump system, right? So the only way for the body to actually have that process done, where they, it's taking away bad stuff, putting back good stuff, and, and does the reparation, is actually through movement, right? So, so literally, if we don't do that, or you know, those kinds of motions, our wrist cannot get nutrients, and so on for all the other joints, including the spine. Um, 
this is a, this is a depiction of the fascia, the connective tissue, uh, and I'll go into more of what that is in a second, but I want you to see this, um, even without understanding what fascia is, it's kind of um, a lot of uh, tissue on top of our muscles and kind of between, between everything, kind of connects everything together. And normally in a young person who's active, it has this really regular structure. And for, for people who have been sitting down a lot, it becomes like this. So we need to, uh, it, this, is, this is malleable, this is reversible, but you need to, you need to be doing a lot of stretching to, to actually apply tension that uh, you know, straighten the, straightens them out again. Now, there's a lot to say about stress, and we all know that our work can be stressful. You know, when we have releases or production decides to go down, or, you know, I know some people, not me, push directly to production. Um, and stress is actually on par. Um, you know, before in the 1900s, we had all these things that people died from. And, you know, cancer was a small thing. Heart disease was still b uh, big, but not as big as now and now the the two leading causes are cancer and heart disease and heart disease of course is directly linked to stress now stress is not necessarily bad um we need some stress you know if there's not a lot of stress we get bored it's like it's too easy right but if we get too much stress that we can't handle or for too long then it becomes something else and the, the, a good distinction to, to have in your heads is when is the point that stress becomes strain. So stress is applying a force uh, or a load to, uh, to anything, you know, uh, an object or um, a system, um, you know, when you're doing your, your stress testing or whatever. Uh, strain is when it actually um, starts changing the shape of that uh, system. Um, or the structure of it. Now, this slide is um, like we can do another two talks about just this. So you'll have to take my word for it, uh, or you can look in the in the books that I have at the end. But there's evidence that um, when we go through stress repeatedly and we don't recover from it, that this um, this pattern. Uh, comes into our bodies. And it has a lot to do with uh, neurological patterns that are connected to fear, right? So if someone shoots a gun, the, the so-called, it's called the startle response, people go like this, right? It's, it's an instinct. Um, of course, I hope at least no one is shooting at you guys. But when we go through stress, the same thing happens to a smaller degree, right? Your body reacts in, the, in that same way. It's just not so, um, uh, so uh, big that you can notice it. So, oh, and, and by the way, does that look similar to what kind of happens by sitting on a chair anyway? Right? So we could say that one helps the other. So, uh, stress, stress shapes our bodies if we don't recover from it. And I, I've thought a lot about, you know, our health systems, and it, it doesn't really matter in which country you live. Some health systems are better. Uh, some countries are better in their health systems than others. But what is common everywhere is that, you know, we're... Um, it's, it's a react, uh, reactive uh, policy, right? We, there has to be something wrong for you to go to the doctor. And then we have some solutions. Usually by that time, it, I, wanna, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's pretty late, right? You already have an issue and the, the distance, you can't go back in time necessarily. Not everything is absolutely uh, reversible. So it's, it's up to us to, to lead this. Uh, for ourselves, right? There's no one, um, there's a, a ton of money, you know, 
on being spent to discover new cancer treatments, there isn't a lot of money being spent on how to keep spines good, right? I mean, on a research uh, level. And when we, when we look at the kind of solutions that are available, um, right, that, uh, right, right now in our societies, you know, we, we have the, the doctors, and um, <laughs> I, I put this image there because it reminded me of when I went to the doctor about my knee. After my knee incident during COVID, the inflammation went, went by, but uh, my knee started clicking heavily, right? So you, I would get up from bed and would go click, but really, really loudly, both knees actually. And I would walk and it would just keep clicking. Now that was before there was no clicking. But what doctors will tell you about clicking is that if it's not painful, it's not an issue. I'm like, I get that, but, you know, I had this period of 35 years when there was no clicking. Then I did one stupid thing one day, and then there was a lot of clicking. You can see how something in that, you know, one day happened, and I want to reverse that. How do I do that? No one knew how to, you know, what the answer is to that. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have uh, fitness trainers of all styles. I, I don't have a quarrel with any particular one. My quarrel with even, you know, even the, let's say, the more spiritual ones like yoga and whatever, is that they all believe that they are the ones that you should be doing. The same with manual therapy. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, massage, osteopathy. Uh, usually people in that, you know, discipline really believe that, that that is the way. And I've already talked about the standing desks. I won't go over that again. Um, but in reality, everything works. Everything works, right? Otherwise, it would have, well, Okay, maybe there's a few things that really don't work, but people still go to them, but I, I don't, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, apart from those, mostly everything works, uh, but for some people, for some of the time. And we don't really know, uh, you know, for whom and when. And unfortunately, these, the people in the previous slide, they don't talk to each other. They all have their own language to discuss the, the same things, uh, their own belief systems, and they don't make an effort to to map uh, you know those between them. This is not particularly different to us, by the way, because you know this is a, let's say a Java conference. You don't see many .NET people here, right? And we're doing the same stuff. We have pretty much the same tools. Um, so you know, I think um, we need we need to to. Uh, make more uh, more of an effort there. Um, and then, you know, depending on who you go to, depending on what kind of tool they have, they will suggest that kind of solution. So if you go to an orthopedic with back pain, they'll say, well, go do an MRI. If it's, you know, bad enough, we'll, we'll have to put you to surgery. Um, so I told you a lot of uh, bad stuff. What do we do? First of all, we have to update our thinking models, right? Um, we thought we really thought that the body was made of microservices. Someone took a knife. Uh, I, I can't remember when the first dissection was. I think it was maybe a hundred years ago, maybe a little longer, maybe two hundred. Anyway, uh, it was near uh, one hundred multiple. Um, and you know, we started drawing these pictures, and that's how we all grew up. We 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 um, we have been looking at these pictures for many many years. Uh, all of us, including professionals and non-professionals. And the, the implicit thing about this photo is that there's nothing holding these bones together. If you had that skeleton, you'd have to pin the bones the, so that they stay in that way. There's nothing connecting those bones. Now, if you go to the muscles, a similar thing applies because the, the muscles, um, if you cut a muscle, it's, a, it's just a lump, right? So there's a lot going on that gives form to the body and is holding it together. And we're only just uh, starting to, to figure that out. 
So this is where the fascia comes in. The, what I was saying earlier, and actually I'll show you what the fascia is and come back to this one. This is what it looks like. This is the, um, the tissue that exists between stuff. And through all the history of anatomy, we've been cutting through it and throwing it away and say this is not important. So it never made it to the books, and up until now, really, in the last sort of uh, 10 years. And this guy, Tom, Thomas Myers, and uh, several others, but he makes a, a very good summary in his book, um, that are saying, well, this is missing. <laughs> this is all the stuff that we've been throwing away as non-important, and we're finding out that it's actually pretty important. This is uh, a dissection of all the, the fascia layers. Um, and you see how deep it goes. This is uh, the back of the, the glute. There's no muscle here. This is all, you know, skin and then fascia, fascia, fascia. So, and it, it wraps around all our bodies. So it's kind of like, um, <laughs> I'm sorry for the parallel with food, but, um, you know, if you, if you have a chicken roast, right, it has this net around it. Otherwise, everything just, you know, you can't hold it together. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Now, uh, what, what Thomas Myers actually, like his work is about, is he did a lot of dissections and a lot of studies um, on people. And he's, he was a, he's a manual therapist. And he figured that um, part of what the fascia does is transfer force. Right, so we've been all this time. Even if you go to the gym, we've been thinking in levers. Right, we have the bone, um, the bone and the muscle, and you just lever s uh, some weight up. Now, what he's been saying, this is all connected, but in a very specific way. It's not just a generic, oh, this is all connected, you know, uh, spiritual thing. Uh, so, for example, this line on the back of the head, it actually starts over here, right? So, there's muscles that start from the front of the scalp, and this is, um, you know, you can see this despite my, despite my nice haircut. Uh, but it goes back all the way down here through the, these uh, large muscles on the back, all the way down through the, the hips, so it goes inside, like the, the stuff on top of it, goes down the back of your leg, and it actually finishes over here, right? It goes under, there's more stuff over here, and finishes here. So that is, is um, well-placed to work as a unit. And these are all the units that he discovered, and they actually have influence between each other. They don't work in isolation, but these are, you know, this is an improvement in how we think about it. So, um, you know, he said, you know, up to now we've been thinking, oh, we have 600 muscles. If we cut here and then cut there, cut there, cut there, cut there, we get 600 pieces. Then, he, so he goes, well, do we really have one muscle with 600 um, uh, pockets? Uh, this is him explaining the concept of uh, tensegrity. This is, um, tensegrity is, uh, I don't know how, how to explain it really, but this is a tensegrity structure. You'll see that it has uh, many things that are connected all to each other. And in this video, he, um, I don't know if we can raise the volume, is there a way? Probably I should have told you that from the beginning. Anyway, he explains that the, the pieces of wood are like the bones, and then the, uh, the, the dark, the, the black um, lines are like the connective tissue. So when he starts pushing the, the two uh, pieces together, we expect probably that the other two pieces of wood will grow apart, but they actually come closer together as well, right? So it's a whole system that interacts with each other, and you can't take things in isolation. So we need to be applying systems thinking uh, to understand what's going on inside our bodies. It's not as isolated as we've made it out to be. Um, so when someone says to me, oh, you know, I went to football and I told my ACL because I didn't warm up. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you led a life up to that point 
that created a system where the ACL was the weakest part, and that day it cracked, right? So we tend to see injuries as, a, as something that happened in an isolated event in a point in time when it's actually everything that we've done up to that point. And, you know, I have a lot of people, uh, when, I, when we discuss these matters, they go, well, well, thanks, but I feel fine. I get it. I don't think it will happen to me. I know this guy who is smoking every day, and he made it to 95. Totally reasonable. So I'll offer the, uh, the other side of the argument. This is uh, about a real person, and um, she, she, uh, she gave me permission to present her story here. Um, and there, she's not a developer, but she's a... Um, uh, she does work from a desk, so she was hired, let's see, uh, May 2019, she was really promoted quickly in six months because she was a high performer. This is important, right? We punish our high performers <laughs> in, in uh, this business. Um, and then, uh, you know, COVID started, she worked from home, workload went up, like in my case and like so many other cases, and then just just really... Um, in a, a few months later, she started having intense headaches and back pain. Headaches can be uh, caused by a lot of stuff going on over here. She got a new chair, but that it really didn't matter. They kept pushing work to her. The pain intensified. Um, she lost her neck mobility. She couldn't like move her neck very much. Uh, her, her breathing became restricted. And when she had an MRI, she had a lot of uh, osteophytes, which is the, the bone growth that I showed you earlier. And I mean, it's just bad stuff. I, I, this is really shocking to me. But look at the timeline, right? Uh, by the way, before this, there was no big incident. She, had, she didn't have an accident. She didn't have a lot of pain. It, you know, just something happened, but we can't really find it here, right? So it's just there was a point when the stress became too much and became strain. So her body actually started shifting really quickly. So in the space of three years, she's become um, partially disabled. She can't actually sit on a chair anymore. She has to work standing or uh, laying down. So this is to say, you know, what if what if this is? I don't want to say you guys, but what if this is me? That scares me. Right? Because, I mean, I had the chance to do an MRI, but before that, so I know a little bit about what's going on in my body, but we don't really know how quickly this can, this can happen, right? We don't, until it does, and then it's, it's a little too late. And, you know, this is true of most situations. People have to be in a lot of pain to actually take action. But by, by that point, the effort required to make a change is really big. When you're down here, you have a little bit of pain, maybe, or you're just looking long-term, like the, the 80, what, how do I want to be when you're 80? The effort can be quite low. And of course, over here, there's urgency, right? I think that now it's urgent. Um, I had another one, or maybe not. Okay, uh, motivation, okay. Uh, there's, there's many forms of motivation. This is, you might have seen this from other kind of management books or whatever. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip it. Basically, the idea is that you you have to motivate yourself. There's no one uh, to do it externally, and the more you need something, the 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 less uh, uh, distance you can travel, right? The the less yield you can have. So we have to be proactive. Uh, be thankful for warning signs. Um, if they do come up, they don't always. I talked about the injury. Uh, often the pain doesn't show up in the the, the place that it has. An, an, we have an issue. So uh, in the example of carpal t carpal tunnel, we get pain here because we we do this twist. But actually, the problem is up here on the shoulder. Uh, be careful about the exercise that you go and do because you're usually drawn to the exercise that it feels natural to you and you're going to be successful in, but that is your strongest and you need to be training your weakest, right? So I was, uh, you know, I'm, you can see I'm a bulky guy. I'm not naturally drawn to lifting weights and, you know, feeling strong and all of that. 
but actually what I need more is flexibility work and, and yoga class, right? So this is, uh, I try to put together some suggestions you guys can uh, take away. Please take a photo of this because I probably have to rush it. I'm in overtime already, so take a lot of breaks when you can. When you start noticing that your body becomes fidgety or your posture breaks, walk away from the desk and don't take a device or walk to another device, right? Don't go to the PlayStation, go outside. Um, Let's start stretch, stretching on our desk, and uh, I'll be posting probably some of those uh, on my social media. Uh, encourage others to do the same. I heard a story about uh, a guy who was uh, taking a walk every day from one to two, and then his colleagues were like, oh, you, you know, you're letting, letting us down. I'm like, he's, you know, you should copy him, you know, not tell him he's um, letting you down. And then after work, make sure you compen compensate for what, what's been happening all day, right? So stretch, move your joints, and decompress your spine. Um, engage in the, a physical activity that you want to be doing. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but if you do train, right? So if you do exercise, have some sort of transition from sitting on the chair to doing that activity, right? Don't be like me that I was, you know, sitting down and then the next moment I was jumping up and down like an idiot. Um, uh, correlate the activities you do with stress. So if it's been a really stressful day, don't, you know, don't do a high stress workout, do a recovery workout. By the way, recovery and rest are not the same. Recovery means you move and you stretch and you do all those kinds of things rest is you go to sleep. It's, they're, not, they're not the same. Uh, if you use devices to track your heart rate or whatever, do double down with uh, a manual test. So for example, in the example of the heart rate, you know, use your fingers up your throat um, to establish a biofeedback loop, right? So as you're looking at the device, you're understanding the heart rate and then you have um, tactical feedback and that goes into your neurology. Uh, limit dependencies, coffee. You know, I, I, I don't know how many conferences I've been to. There've, there's been stickers about programmers, uh, you know, input coffee, output code. Jesus Christ. Um, coffee is great. I love coffee, but please, in you know, limited quantities because it does increase your stress response, right? It uh, exceeds, uh, excretes adrenaline. If you use headphones, please stop. Don't use them all the time. Only use them every so often. What happens is that um, our ears need air to stay healthy, and we're always uh, blasting sound on them. So there are actually studies that are saying that we're becoming deaf uh, a lot faster. And let's see, what else? Uh, wear shoes as little as possible. That's my last slide, I swear. Um, and uh, make an effort to be social and speak to others and connect. Uh, I know we're all introverts and we like to be in our heads. Uh, but uh, this is a kind of summary that I wanted to, to give you that, you know, you have to compensate for what's been going on through the day. And this is my, my own idea about myself when I get into this zone where I'm just thinking of stuff and I'm, you know, coming up with ideas and I forget about my body. Like, I feel like I'm you know, a person pushing around a brain, right? Let's not be that. Let's, let's realize that we're one and, and really take care of ourselves. Thank you very much. Please give me any questions you have. <laughs>